Good evening, everyone. So welcome to an interesting topic, as we always do uh, certain interesting things uh, from OPA. So as uh, we all mentioned, now we know what where we are today in, as a country and how we built them in the recent <laughs> past. And uh, where are we going to in the next future? What are the crises? Uh, how the crisis is going to help us? What are the things that we need to do? do in coming up with new uh, future and how our new generation going to be set up with this. Yeah. So we are in a new situation. Every time we need to understand how the crisis can build new ideas, new innovations, yeah. as well as how we going to stand up in a crisis situation is very much important rather than we doing in a business or either we do our normal day-to-day -day life in a very comfortable soon. So let first of, uh, for the, uh, uh, after a long time, we are going to talk about the crisis um, uh, situation on OPA. So let me welcome all of you as a good evening to all of you and uh, to make this event as a success as first of all, I would like to invite our president of OPA, Mr. Dulita Perra, uh, to welcome the gathering. Mr. Dulita, it's over to you. Thank you. I think there is an issue in video enabling. Um, so host has not allowed the video to be uh, switched on. So until that is uh, sorted out, I will just uh, get on with uh, the subject since we are already into about nine minutes from the starting schedule starting time. Uh, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome each and every one of you for this uh, joint seminar, webinar rather. Uh, on current economic crisis and industrial challenges organized by the seminar, workshops and programs committee together with national issues committee and uh, committee on development and sustenance of foreign, ex uh, foreign currency based sectors in Sri Lanka. Well, these are all standing committees of OPA and uh, I think uh, they have done a lot of work in this area uh, with regard to coming out with uh, multiple uh, proposals on how we should, uh, how we could overcome this uh, economic challenges. And also we've got uh, two resource personnel who is joining today. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, both of them as well. Uh, Mr. Ranjit Dharmasiri, Director, Investment Appraisal Department of the Board of Investment on a parallel side, and also um, uh, Mr. D.H. Vijayawadana, who is the past president of the Sri Lanka Institute of Architects. And then we also have our own resource personnel from, uh, from OPA, uh, past president Ruan Garlege, and Dr. Thilina Vanigasekara, and Dr. Keithi Atanayaka, who is joining. Uh, as a moderator on this session. So we are in for a very thought-provoking uh, session. Uh, without much to do, I will hand it back to um, Ruan to take it to the next level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dolita. Uh, okay, uh, as we um, know that this particular um, seminar was uh, organized by many of the organization of OPA. One is seminar and workshop and program committee and the national issues committee, the joint uh, program. So first of all, I would like to uh, call the chairman of seminar, workshop and program committee, Ms. Engineer Saman Kandanyarachi to address the gathering. Engineer Saman, it's over to you. Thank you, Dr. Ruan. So this is a timely se seminar as our president OPA mentioned. This is actually current uh, regarding the, our fifth uh, uh, seminar series uh, regarding the, our current uh, country facing economic crisis and how the industry challenges facing. So in our today's webinar, we are going to discuss about the uh, broadly in the, how the economy is affected and then uh, medical sector, and then also construction sector, and also about the apparel sector. So, and also there's uh, our uh, 
uh, we are going to have a panel discussion about this matter and then yeah, going. so i'm very happy to uh, this about the uh, resource person who accept this seminar so i would like to hand over dr ruan to proceed with the uh, proceeding for dr ruan thank you uh, engineer saman so as i said this is a joint um, seminar organized by many companies are participating for this so let me call upon dr nigoda who is the chairman of national issues committee and committee of development dr nigoda it's over to you to address the gathering uh, thank you mr uh, reko but again i have to say that i can't open the video uh, right anyway uh, thank you and first and foremost uh, on behalf of the national issues committee i would like to thank the chairperson of the seminars workshops and programs committee engineer saman kandana arachi uh, for taking the leadership in arranging this timely essential webinar since we are facing the worst possible crisis situation in our mother country we as professionals have responsibility to find out the real picture of it and make reports to the higher authorities on how the situation affects uh, to the different industries and finally to the people in the country because of this crisis we are faced we are experiencing many burning national issues such as uh, economy of the country and we are begging for in currency many issues with fuel problem not availability of gas which is like basic need and issues with electricity supply issues in the health sector in construction industry and important import important export etc are uh, exist so thank you opa for giving this opportunity uh, uh, to uh, these uh, three committees to have this important webinar and warmly welcome all the eminent panelists to conduct the webinar thank you very much thank you dr migoda okay as everyone said uh, we know everyone knows that we are in a crisis situation however it might impact differently for different organization different industries as well as for the general public in different situations however we all need to stand up in this critical situation as a one nation how we do it how a single industries do is how the major critical industries do is is what we are going to talk on no, today so to uh, yeah. have an uh, uh, very worth wealthful discussion first of all i would like to introduce our um, moderator dr kirti atnayaka he was uh, he's a um, very competent person who helps to opa activities in most of the ways for uh, coming up with um, a member for many uh, uh, committees of opa and the convener of national issues committee and uh, he's a lecturer of uh, chemistry silo as we all know he is uh, very familiar with most of the industries uh, issues and i hope he is one of the competent persons to moderate this event so let me call upon dr keerthy athanayaka uh, to handle um, the today's program dr keerthy it's over to you uh, thank you dr reko uh, for your kind introduction uh, so while experiencing the re real crisis with the power cut uh, there at opa so we are about to start so without taking much time as we are struggling with the power cut i would like to introduce our first uh, panel member for this session uh, mr ranjit darbasir di uh, director investment boi and mr ranjit darbasir is a, a bsc holder uh, from Uh, University of Sri Jayawardenepur in Business Administration and MSc in Customs Administration and many more years experience in BOI uh, with uh, in various capacities uh, in different. Uh, 
sections and I, I think we uh, need the current of this crisis and the point of BOI is experience. So without much ado, uh, I would like to hand over the uh, podium to uh, Mr. Ranjit Dharmasiri to uh, start the session. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kirti, for your kind introduction. I am grateful to the OPA for inviting. And my topic is current economic crisis industry challenges of apparel sector in industry in Sri Lanka. Next. I will run through all the background of what you need to know about the apparel sector highlights, industry strengths, challenges, BI facilitation to mitigate challenges and industry requests. Next, I'll talk for a bit about apparel sector in Sri Lanka highlights. Apparel sector is one of the important industries contributing to the national economy. It provides more than 350,000 direct employments and over 600,000 indirect employments. Export income is the most important thing with this regard. Since 1992, one of the most apparel, most uh, income source in the government is apparel sector exports. In 2017, it was US dollar 4 billion 0.7, and it has increased up to US dollar 5 billion in 2019. And due to the COVID pandemic uh, situation, it was uh, reduced to 3.9 billion in 2020. And gradually, it was increased after the COVID pandemic up to 4.9 billion. What is the appropriate target to be achieved? 6 billion by 2022. And in addition to that, billion, 8 billion by 2025. Apple sector is 43% of the national exports. In addition to that, it is 53% of the industrial national exports. In 2022, from January to March, the export income of the apparel industry has increased by 21%. What are the major export countries? USA, EU, and UK. When we are exporting to the EU, it's needed to enjoy that uh, GSP concession. But the utilization of this concession is very low. In 2020, it is 51%. In 2019, it was uh, 52%. So why? So there's a rules of origin. We have to source our own, own raw materials within our country. As a solution with the JAF, Joint Apparel for, Forum in Sri Lanka, we have established a fabric park in Erao. Already JJ Mir Sri Lanka Limited has, agreement, has signed that agreement and they will provide over 400 employment opportunities. In addition to that, they will invest about 35 million US dollars. Star Garments has already submitted the application. In addition to that, Ocean Lanka Limited and the ATG Silon Private Limited, they verbally committed and they will invest US dollar 100 million each. What are the industry strengths? Quality source in destination and highly skilled, trainable, adaptable workforce. We are moving to the knowledge-driven economy. And fair labor practices, garments without guilt. International design will low carbon, with low carbon footprint by following this greenery concept. 
port connectivity through expressways. And the main strength of this apparel sector is catering and delivering to the world's best brands. Next, I would like to draw your attention to the challenges, high cost of labor, low backward integration, high utility cost. And in addition to that, increase of industrial factor costs. High dependency of trade concessions. Except the EU GSP trade agreement, we have very few trade agreements with other countries. So it's needed to create bilateral, multilateral, and treaties with other countries to get the maximum benefit. In 2019, there are several uh, incidents occurred, Easter Sunday attack in 2020 and 21, COVID pandemic and economic crisis in the present. So these were very adversely affected to the apparel sector. After COVID pandemic period, Cancellation of orders, delays in receiving raw materials, vessels passing Colombo, and temporary closing of several factories. What is the current uh, crisis? Power cuts and massive energy crisis. Difficulties in transportation and communicating due, due to lack of uh, fuel. Due to shortage of foreign exchange, government impose import restrictions on importation of goods. This would add the effect to the export-oriented companies, but it was removed since last month. In addition to that, government suspended open account payment for importers. It was also badly affected to the export-oriented companies by discussing with relevant authorities uh, that uh, central banks with the uh, treasury, it has removed from 25th of June, 2022. These are the uh, challenges and what we have done from BOI, BOI facilitation. We have issued several curfew passes in the, fam in the pandemic situation with the help of uh, police department and we vaccinated over 99% employees at export processing zones where the most export oriented companies are located in and Continuously discuss with the CIPETCO and other oil bunkering companies such as John Keels, Lanka Marine, and IOC. And we have taken several steps to buy fuel by paying dollars. As member of the demand management, BOI has taken several steps to remove power cuts to the export and so on. Earlier it was very successful, but now there is three hour power cut. We have, we will take several action to remove this power cut also. In addition to the digitization of import and export documentation, this is very important. After pandemic period, so we have introduced this digitization system for import and export trades. So they can produce their import and export customs documents through web. Sri Lanka customs and BOI are using the same Asuguda world system. And within their office premises or even their houses, they can process these important export caustics. It's very easy. And it can save money and the time. Issuing resident visas for five years, as directed by the investment promotion minister, we have launched this. Earlier, it was issued to the one or two years. Year by year, it had to be uh, renewed, but now we can produce this for a period of five years for the investors and their dependents. Revamping and relaunching BOI website with new business partnership database. In this database, there are several structured project details and in addition to their job bank details. Establishment of Investor Facilitation Center, IFC. Our director general and the chairman they have guided to establish this IFC and it is located in the 27th floor of the West Tower WTC. So when that potential investor or existing investor want to get approval, so all the line agencies are other 
government authorities are interconnected with this IFC within very limited period of time, they can obtain their approvals. Then accordingly, we can issue the letter of approvals. And in addition to that, as directed by the investment promotion minister, we are issuing investment approvals within 24 hours. It's significant things. And we have taken these several steps for the benefit of traders, not only the traders, but also the entire country. Industry requests, this is the last uh, slide of my presentation. To continue permitting purchase fuel directly using dollars, to refrain from imposing power cut to the export processing zone and to assist industry to continue manufacturing process, remove any barriers and restrictions. To continue with the government reviewing the single window trading portal, which has been delayed so many years. I am happy to say this is the significant event and it will be implemented very soon and it will be increase our ease of doing business to a certain extent. If, if you have any questions, clarifications, you may raise within the Q&A session. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Ranjit Darumseri, uh, for your very informative lecture on the on this matter. Now, we'll move to another sector. As I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we are we have we are trying to cover several sectors. Now, I would like to invite Mr. D. H. Vijayvardhana, past president of the Institute of architecture uh, to deliver his presentation related to uh, crisis and uh, situation with respect to the uh, construction industry. Over to you, Mr. Vijayvath. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this very important discussion. Uh, my topic is current economic crisis and industry challenges which, which respect to the construction sector. By my previous speaker, of course, uh, gave a very bright picture on the parallel industry, but I'm afraid the construction sector it's not so good. Anyway, let me uh, we'll take you through the uh, slides. The construction industry, building infrastructure projects, irrigation-based projects. Those are the main areas of construction industry. Then the building sector, you get the state sector and you get the private sector. So you have commercial, industrial, residential. In both sides, you get the same sectors. Then the industry status. The industry contributes to GDP 8 to 10 percent. So previous projection is 9.2 percent. So now they say expected contraction is about 4.6 percent. So we will end up maybe somewhere around six, well, somewhere around four, sorry. Inflation may rise according to uh, central bank. Now it's 56 may go to 70% as per the governor's latest forecast. So you see the chart we are, where we are heading to. So it, it, it's a, not a very rosy picture. Then uh, the price increases of construction materials. Now this is actually worked out in April. Now a bag of cement is now 3,200. So if you compare the December 2020, now it's 100, uh, increase is 155 as per this chart, but now you're supposed it's about now about 100, uh, 175%. The steel similar and structural steel, so on, and all these things are in, 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 in line with the, the price increases, uh, inflation. These are also catching up very, very unprecedented manner that uh, these uh, costs have gone up. 
and industry stays. The industry was suffering for many setbacks for even before this economic downturn due to wrong policies of the state, political turmoil in late 2018, Easter Sunday attack, and COVID pandemic. So these actually construction sector was not very, very stable, though one may look like it's stable. It was not stable. With this, uh, especially with the political turmoil, we lost about I think, $1 billion investment. And East Sunday attack actually had a very bad effect on the tourist sector. COVID, of course, common to the entire world. So we can't do much about it. And when the present government came into power, they decided to give it a shock treatment. I would call it shock treatment by following action on their own. Actually, they didn't speak to the sectors, the architectural, structural, many, and contractors. Actually, they didn't. Actually, we haven't had a much friendly discussion on what to do, how we can uh, get a, get uh, uh, get out of this situation. But they, on their own, decided this. So they, what they did, they started the hundred kilometer road project and continue with the urban housing program. And also in the city of Kalamu to build four multi-story car parks. I don't know how many of you all know that these things are happening. Then accelerated highways, all other sector construction projects, accelerated water supply projects, and so on. The 100 meter kilometer road project is just a political slogan. And they haven't worked out the material requirements, the manpower requirements, and what happened was, so far, only 10,000 kilometers is completed, and some of the flyovers have been already stopped. And, and the biggest problem is this was given to smaller tigers. So they had very big plan, and they import a certain, material, certain equipment and go into the bank. And they have actually, now there's a huge problem. They cannot repay these loans. And the government has asked them to stop work. And you see the bottom line, the roads 100,000 kilo, 100, kilometers. The government owned all these people 65 billion at the moment. And urban housing program is something that is uh, happening uh, over the years. And here the issue is, these are all the design build, fixed price contracts. Now you saw what the, how the prices have gone up. So almost uh, these have come to a standstill and they are discussing on, on the price escalation. And I think uh, still not, because what the thing is, if you discuss today and come in a week's time, you get a different price. So escalation and some of the contractors uh, said that they, they want to work with uh, uh, cost plus 7% profit. That sort of a thing, it has happened. In the city of Galamo built four multi-story car parks. And, uh, and, you know, this two and a half years ago, we thought of putting up multi-story car parks. But today, we can't import a car for the next so many years, and we don't have fuel. And in many other countries, uh, major cities, they have stopped cars coming into the city. Now, if you see in you know, Beijing, Delhi, they have stopped. And even if you go to London, uh, the plan approvals are not accepted if we show car parks because they don't want cars to come to city. But we invited them and now we have just buildings but no cars. So accelerated highways project, you know, they are all standstill and they are stopped. Then other uh, projects also circular issues to stop work. Water supply project, same situation. Even the foreign funded projects, the funds are now being collected by the government to import essentials. So other building sectors, the government oh, government has to pay 150 billion to the contractors. So you can imagine the situation of the contractor and couple with the consultants. So now effect is request temporary stop work. Few projects are moving. Most work stop or proceeding at a low pace. So is the is is the is it the right thing to do? The government, of course, all of a sudden state stop work. But what are the repercussions? Now, the construction is something that related to all the sectors. Though it looked like a separate sector, it is related to education, medical, agriculture, transportation, trading, export, import, so on. It is connected to all the sectors. Now, when you say all of a sudden stop work, 
it eventually and gradually affect all the sectors. Now, immediate issues of this threat of losing direct employment to persons, losing of indirect employment to persons. Now, the construction sector has a lot of uh, connecting chains, you know. A man is, uh, is uh, taking sand and then a lorry driver and supplying sand and a brick manufacturer and, you know, and imports of various uh, items, equipment, all that chain gets stopped. Breakdown of building material manufacturing now. Now we were crying that we don't have cement, we don't have steel. But very soon, there'll be excess steel, excess cement. And what will happen to these factories that, that, that produce uh, steel and, and, and aluminum and so on? Aluminum, already they have reduced the prices because I think probably they don't have much sales. And one of the important things we are facing is training down to students. Now architects, engineers, uh, technical te technologists and so on, they are training. Actually, they all, if you look at architects, they are trained on private sector. Private sector consultancies and uh, they, they learn from, but now, now they, they lose uh, training rounds. Break down regular general maintenance of work of and building related equipment. Now, sometimes we see getting a full tank of petrol or getting a, a new gas cylinder will solve the, that's just the tip of iceberg. Now, I was told by a lift uh, maintenance contractor, there are about 20 lifts, lifts stop working because you, they don't have spare parts. Now, if you look at many, many things, you need repair kits. Now, if you have a toilet fitting, which is you for five years, you get a, you had a repair kit. Now, those things are not there. So, it's a very chain reaction that we are facing, uh, though we may not see it as at present. Then when you ask to stop work, contract your complications. Contractors will say, okay, now, you know, to order tile, it takes at least six months. So most of the contractors, well in advance, they have ordered tile. They paid an advance and waiting for the production to come. But now they ask, government has asked to stop. Now when the tiles come, what will happen to those tiles? Who is going to pay? What will happen to the contractor? Scale down or stop planned activities. Now, you know, there are universities, they, they you know, our universities uh, intake a lot of students pending construction of these buildings. I know there are two medical faculties. They have, they are taking students so that they will have buildings in time to come. Now, what will happen to those students? No building, all stuff. Uncompleted structure in the city scale. Now, we talk about tourism. Now, already, if you see the, if you go to four. One of the biggest buildings in transfer house is now half completed. How long will that stay? So what will happen to our streetscape? What are the broad options we have? Now, only thing, only thing, uh, the government should have acted on this disaster about a year ago because the government said, we have money, we have money, not, nothing to worry. Until water came to the nose. Now, the solutions are very difficult. But still, if you really try, because the, the construction sector, you must keep them alive. You must not allow them to die. So, one is study the projects individually rather than blanket decisions. Certain important projects you can select and keep them. And do a priority list. You can say these university buildings are important. So this part you do. Now, rest you stop. Prepare reports on status of the project. If you are just uh, complete started, you can easily stop. Or if you're nearing completion, let's finish it. You know, that, that, that budget is not very big in, if you think that way. Decide on projects that could complete soon. High priority, high priority projects. Select projects that can be complete in stages. So if you have 10 story block, you complete say five floors. So the contractor has work and things are moving. Uh, so that, that should have been the possibility rather than waiting to the last moment to stop work. CEDA should come in a big way. They should work out the contractual problems that we are going to face with this stopping the problem. Because contractor, government will not pay, but they will make a huge claim against the government for asking them to stop work. You know, they, they have engineers, they have machinery, 
they have uh, all these things as such. Sai, you have to pay. One day you have to pay. So those are the issues with the, those are the options that we can now work on. And, and at least some of the projects can go, some work can go. So the material that produced can, can be used. So in this, I wish to make some recommendations. So as a priority workout, payment plan for the contractors, consultant on outstanding payments so that these institutions could survive during the crisis. I am not asking to pay 65 billion or 150 billion, but let's pay them some percentage. I know the government has no money, but then we do have to work out some, some mechanism. Otherwise, these people, 1.2 million people, what are they going to do? So just, just closing the shop is not an issue. Study the design material, scale, and changes that would help to reduce the cost. Now, you have to contact the engineers, architects, quantity surveyors, and then look at these optional important buildings and see now you have tile. Why don't you have cement and finish this building? So those are the those are the uh, good options that should create. Now we have in sometimes you know we have very fancy facade. Let's forget it for the moment, but complete the building. That should that should be the way to solve this problem, not to complete the stop work. Scale down by number of buildings. So if you have a complex, let's start only one building. So the contractor mobilized can slowly do that work. So he he, he has something to do. Complete only hull of the structure. You just come with the structure and just leave it. I mean, the contract to suit the change without leaving it to dispute. Now we are just waiting all disputes to happen. But the authority, CEDA, should work out. Okay, government has asked to stop work. Now this is the strategy we should work so that there won't be any disputes. I and mean, we can't just leave them uh, uh, to that, that situation. Then, then the construction sector has contributed in a big way to this economic crisis, carrying out projects that are not in national physical plans or deviating from them. You know, there's a, Sri Lanka has a national physical plan developed by the National Physical Department. That's a department now, now it is overruled by you know, various political, political reasons. That is the department decide what building, when to build, where to build. That is as per the national physical plan. And what they do, they don't look at. They either deviate from them. Commencing projects without fund allocation. You just pay the advance to the contractor, even say 20%, just pay 10% and that's it. The rest they don't pay. Because they don't have allocation. Getting foreign loans on higher rates without studying the rate of return and a viable repayment plan. You just start. You just start and then see what happens. Political based decision on location of project. So this, this has contributed a lot to the our, to the this crisis. So just I want to point out there's no politics in this, but just to show what things we have done. You know, there are about nine projects, the Lotus Tower, Defense Headquarters. We have secretary of buildings. In, in districts, you know, the cost of the secretary buildings, 5 billion, 4 billion, 3 billion. Now the world trend is different. People are not coming to the world. If you see, they won't work from home. Only, only important people are coming. But we are building a, a secretariat in Polonnaruwa, spending 6 billion rupees. You see, the, you see, these things are not in the national physical plan. These are just decisions that they are taken. Uh, then, then if you if you, I, you can talk a lot about these things, you know, Lotus Tower, you know what what have you worked on rate of return, and then these I think that much is last tower to build in a city because this is a 20th century, uh, the the decision because if you have Shanghai, Beijing, uh, Toronto, who have all those buildings have uh, towers, but that is when. That, that technology is gone. Now it's satellite technology. Now the whole purpose of that tower is lost. But it is not no longer a, 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 a telecommunication tower. Now if you see the 2000 capacity convention hall in Hamban Kota, you know, this was to be officially, this was to be built in Kota. But 
can you imagine it was built in Kota, what benefit people have, what, how it will function? Then the Matal Airport. You know, National Physical Plan had the airport located in Hingudagbuda, center of the country. It's easy for various things. But, you know, so these are the non, these projects don't give any money. So it, it contributes to the disaster. So who decide to generate a building project now? So this is a very important question because I told you, if the department or somebody needs a building, it should go to the National Physical Planning Department and it should be in the, in the, in the, in the overall plan. Now we know the, the Kurunagala uh, Trincomalee Corridor. You know, that's a, that's a National Physical Planning Department has surveyed future Sri Lanka will, will be developed on this corridor. So what? So we had to keep do roads, we had to do infrastructure so that we are ready for the, for the development. It, it, so it, if you don't like MCC, we can go to someone else and do this. Because this is, this is a, this is a future, future planning. Then who decide? Ministry, departments, university heads decide, okay, I want to have this huge building in my my university but it, it so whether that that building is required whether that the the capacity of the building is required there is no professional inputs so that so so you keep on building buildings so that is one of the biggest decisions that one should take you must not allow just authority to build buildings because if you go to uh, monoragal if you go to uh, so the north, those students don't have even a roof over their schools. But we have excess space in Kalamu officers. So that is the big imbalance. So do they look into this following requirement before building national priorities? Now the Lotus Tower is the national priority. Availability of fund. We don't have fund. We borrowed funds to the sum of 120 US million US dollars. What is the return? No return. Economic sustainability. If a loan, rate of return, repayment capacity, you should have first work out what is the rate of return. Benefit to the majority citizens. It should benefit to the majority citizens. If starting a mid of financial year, there are provisions in the national budget. There must be provisions in the national budget. Otherwise, you postpone it. Whether existing building spaces can be recognized to get the building requirements. Now, I told you that decision makers think they want a building. Now, if you go to the University of Peradeniya, how many auditoriums they have? They have five auditoriums and a main major auditorium. And these auditoriums, if you look at, they use them once a year, the department ones, and they are all well air conditioned to maintain those auditoriums. But then why can't we share? Now, if you go to Malaysia, if you go to university, you have one auditorium main auditorium. Lecture halls are common. They're all controlled by computer. I mean, you don't have my, my lecture hall, your lecture hall, it's common lecture hall. So we, we, we use this. So we, rather than keep on building, 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 we can, we can utilize that, that funds for a better return. Then, then we don't go into crisis. Sharing facilities, office spaces, auditoriums, lecture hall, libraries, now, if you go to a teaching hospital, I'm just telling, uh, a foreign consultant came once and said, you have, you have specialist doctors, toilets, gents and ladies, then you have other medical staff toilets, sisters toilets, nurses toilets, minor staff toilets. You know, it's a whole set of toilets. We have to change our thinking. You know, we have to have, if you go to other country, you have these staff toilets, Maybe senior staff, junior staff, that's all. Then we just, so that's all. So we have wasted a lot of money for these things. So even we, by doing all these fancy things, we are, we are headed to this disaster. Specific requirement like air conditioning, utility facilities, to have a national policy. Now, what is the national policy air conditioning? If the university people think they want air conditioning, they air condition. So, it, so if you now, air conditioning is not an essential thing. Now, you know, architect Jeffrey Baba designed a building in, in Union Place. 
the Mahavali Center, he created a natural ventilation system under the, under the window at high level. So some areas of co India, all the officers. Now, if you see the Labor Secretariat and the Provincial Council office in Bath, entirely, they are, they are all central air conditioned. How about the defense headquarters? It is all central air conditioned. You know, uh, the, the cost, there are three wings. The cost of each wing for air conditioning, the cost of air conditioning, 1.5 can, can Sri Lanka afford these things? That is why we have led to this crisis. You know, we have to have some policy. We have to have control over these things rather than leaving to few people who doesn't know the subject. So I have a recommendation for that. Update the national visual plan in consultation with relevant stakeholders. List out parties on the needs and gather this document so that this cannot be changed due to political reasons. You have a, you get the services of experts and prepare a national plan for the entire country where, the, where there be uh, equal distribution of uh, 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 resources. Uh, the, a, a, a child in the monorail gets the same type of school, equal distribution of them. You, you gasset it and no politicians can change it other, other than going back to the National Physical Planning Department. So it is, it is not so now. So equal distributed resources to be maintained national level. You know, if you control this, your national budget will definitely come down. If you, if you, if you, if you work out a plan, we, we, we are not in a plan. We think put up a, this thing, that thing, they are here everywhere. We don't look at. Now we have put up a thousand way dot in Amban Twitter. No patience. So this, we have not worked out the, the, the realistic thing. A clear policy on standard passage given to official staff, visitors. Sharing of resources. This is an important thing that we have to share of resources. We don't like to share. You know, this is my library. No one should come here. This is my lecture hall. This is my auditorium. No one can come. If you see Colombo, you have a building, one department has auditorium. Next, next floor, another. Now, next wing has another department. They have also auditorium. They don't want to share. But the auditorium functions very, very rarely. So we, we, we can't do that luxury in Sri Lanka. When national budget is prepared, refer it to national physical development plan and implement the projects depending on the priority and the availability of funds. No project to be initiated without allocating funds which will be kept. So that funds are kept. Now we decided to have 100,000 kilo, 100, kilometers of road without funds. They got only 10% advance. That's it. So, I mean, if you see that we have, it is, there's nothing to be strained that we are in a crisis. So establish a procurement commission. You know, we had a procurement commission with all the stakeholders and participated so that you know you see if you see the cope uh, cope committee you see the what is the what is happening at the procurement you know these are all leading to in the building construction sector the procurement system is there now there's no procurement commission and nobody to complain and it goes on this allow cabinet papers that overrides uh, now what happens is the national physical planning department plans are overrided right by cabinet. Cabinet proposal comes, do this project, give it to this consultant, and then it, it or this, uh, go have a design bill. All the projects are design bill. It can't be that. You know, that, that decision has to be taken by uh, responsible people. Uh, use uh, and use more friendly competitive bidding system to secure project where the most responsive bid wins the tender. Break down large projects into separate packages where all will stand a chance to participate in the development programs. The Ruanpura project, the Ruanpura is a very, very, very known project, even only one party. So then the development of other, other contractors, consultants, and likewise. So they just give projects to certain consultants, certain universities, you know, while there are so many waiting for a project, 
So that is why we are heading for that. So we must first thing in what first thing we have to look at this work stoppages of construction work in a more realistic way. So that some some people have some work, all will not lose job, and the industry will remain. In the long run, we must have clear policies on what to build, where to build, how to build, whether we have money to build. That has to be very clearly laid down. Otherwise, we will never be able to get out of this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Vijayvardhana. It's a very informative uh, thing. I think uh, you have taken us to a, a different dimension and a uh, lot of uh, true reasons have been revealed. I think this is the whole uh, uh, objective of our seminar. Uh, so thank you for that uh, lecture again. And I would now I would like to move to another sector uh, with uh, Dr. Helena Valigasekara. She is a very prominent academic member, and she is one of our forum members as well. So I would like her to join with us, uh, taking us to another uh, key important sector and how this crisis has affected uh, those areas. Over to Dr. Tilina. Uh, Dr. Tilina, are you here? Yes. Okay. Thank right. you very much, Dr. Kirti. Uh, uh, my apologies for the disturbances outside because I'm in the middle of the crisis as I'm explaining it to others. So uh, let me uh, start my presentation. Uh, so can you see that? Can you see the slides? Yes, we can see. Okay. Yes, you can go to full presentation yeah. mode. Yes. Uh, can you see now? Sorry that I could not open uh, my um, uh, yes. camera because uh, it is all yeah. dark outside. Right? Yeah, so, quite audible as <laughs> well. Go, yes. So, thank you very much for inviting. I'm representing the SLMA. Uh, mostly, uh, my two eminent speakers previously spoken about the sectors that which could be generating funds or like generating uh, profit. So I'm going to um, speak about a sector where this most uh, consumption part is carried out. So let me explain the impact on the health sector. Now uh, we have identified two visible factors like uh, this is called twin deficit economy. That means this expenditure exceed our national expense income uh, is because of that we are having external debt and we have to depend on uh, certain funders or the like you know uh, countries where uh, supporting us and UN agencies as well right so and also this uh, foreign capital flow we need to uh, like uh, consider all the time when we plan our uh, activities in the health sector Right, so if you see this uh, real GDP growth uh, with the inflation rate, and you can see how uh, like uh, predictions were uh, heading to 2025. As you all know, uh, why this happened? Actually, my two eminent speakers has been pointed out these things. Uh, I will brief that uh, according to our health sector. So we have multiple loans to sustain the public services because mostly consumption services like health and education and also bad economic management and planning as the previous speaker said, more projects with sometimes not having any return of investment. And also these major uh, disasters which we faced like Easter Sunday attack, which was unexpected. And we had to manipulate our uh, retaining funds to man uh, manage that thing and also mostly COVID-19 pandemic and that was uh, uh, like extended more than two and a half years still it is going on with the vaccination program fully uh, funded by the government 
and also bad decision making on fertilizer issues indirectly uh, related to the health sector issues and also decisions on reduction of taxes. Again, we have less revenues in purchasing and also opening up LCs. So if you could see this graph, you can clearly see how we are came up to this level. So it is in 2022, initial month, like in January, beginning of the year, the inflation rate was 3%. And in midway between May, and it was risen, risen towards 39.1%. So you may see uh, how much of uh, uh, inflation uh, like we could face even without our knowledge or with our knowledge. And up to June, it became into 54.6. I think 50%, over 50% mean a country could not function as it is. And it is called hyperinflation. I may not touch upon this uh, topic because it economics, it says so many things, but as citizens, we are facing really a lot of problems. And government's announcement. And also this is related to this uh, international relations, how government is acting on this kind of situation. So suspending of foreign debt, you may have heard somebody who is in the leading uh, economic person has spoken about this. I'm not for or against any uh, person, but the decisions taken haphazardly. And this also uh, raised several problems, making we uh, in further uh, unrest situation. So you may see this graph. It was visible on um, central bank uh, web page. So how the current situation has deteriorated up to this crisis level. So I'm not going into details because of the time permitted and also my uh, resource availability as there is no power, right? So impact on the health sector, mainly this imports because as Sri Lanka, you may be know, know about it, you may be heard about it. 80% of the medical supplies we used in our hospital setup are importing from other countries. That is why in early uh, COVID series, we could not many manage ourselves with the uh, personal protective equipment, including the gloves and the uh, cotton wool, right? And up to 30th of June, there was shortage of over 200 medical items because we could not open the LCs or we could not open the purchasing uh, orders due to lack of money. And also this happened mainly uh, in uh, most essential sectors like cardiology and also in the general medical uh, wards uh, where ICUs, we need antibiotic and vaccines. As we are not, like uh, producing all these agents, uh, the consumables, we had to depend upon the imports. And also number of surgical consumables, you may wonder, including the cotton wool. So we had to depend on imports, right? And also the prices of the drugs. As we all know, we were in tight situation with the import sector. So we had to uh, cut down some of the things and also the pr price uh, increase more than 40% in selected items. Sometimes it is in uh, really uh, essential drugs, it was more than that. And also how this fuel crisis uh, imp uh, the affected the uh, sector. So fuel prices increased more than 137 according to the central bank predictions since last December. So a sector is allocated money when the year begins. And with that, we could, uh, can we manage? So that was the major issue. And also supply chain and the employee attendance has been grossly affected. Sometimes it was more than 50% in certain uh, needy units. And also accessibility to the services by the citizens. That also not directly related to us, but it was a major, uh, problem because then the things uh, arrived at the hospital setup in a worse scenario. And also catastrophic health expenditure. So maybe you may not understand, crisis made the people to spend more money on out-of-stock drugs as well as the transport, right? And also 
consumable prices. You may not consider only the drugs and the people transport, but same time you need to consider about the other consumables where people need to really reach the services. And also these con constant power cuts, it really affects the public uh, living uh, style as well as the medical uh, expenditure. Because now withholding of medical procedures during the power cuts, it will drag the country into another world scenario because it has to be uh, due to congestion and due to extra burden to the uh, health sector and uh, the crisis with the employee payments and overtime schemes. So we had a real burden with all these things. And what is the impact of that at the medium term? So it will uh, create an increased disease burden, including uh, communicable di diseases, because no operation could be sustained to catch the people whom having communicable diseases or the non-communicable diseases. And also due, due to the high consumables or the prices in the uh, food and all other necessary items. So there is a risk of uh, rising malnutrition, not among the children and also uh, pregnant mothers and the adults. And also the reduction of the productivity. So we all have to think about the mental uh, well-being and sustainability of mental health in the uh, citizens as well as employees. Because of this whole set of uh, uh, crises, it made even a normal person to have a, some form of stress. And you may know that will lead to mainly uh, increase the non-communicable diseases such as hypertension and diabetes. And what is the uh, reforms that need to customize? And there are so many uh, proposals coming through the uh, uh, IMF. So they are mainly concerned about the macroeconomic stability and the uh, debt sustainability. And now I heard the previous speaker uh, talk about the luxury of the hospitals uh, with related to toilets. I wanted to highlight that issue because we are the people whom like giving uh, uh, like uh, standards for the people and also in the hospital setup you can't ask everyone to go one toilet because the emergencies comes you can't ask other one to wait outside until the doctor goes and come out and uh, we are uh, still experiencing in the ministry this type of things making the toilet um, like you know uh, this um, not limited to anyone so we had to uh, wait in the queues when we are having a lot of problems and sometimes in the middle of the meeting we are going there but we don't have accessibility so I think even in the offices you can practice that but in the hospital setup you have to critically think about the uh, the like you know uh, the task and the role that they have given and how uh, practical the to think that thing good that uh, we have, uh, if we have certain policies on that thing and the policies should be made on the uh, reality, right? And the reduction of government, government expenditure, uh, mainly expenditure on the services. So that also we have to really uh, think uh, two, three times uh, before making uh, the decisions. Otherwise it will also again become a decision that we took to uh, go ahead with the organic farming. And also the improved tax revenues and production. That is also a good thing. And we have to think about all these with related to the sustainability of the services. And also limitation of import go goods, especially uh, when there is, uh, when we are talking about the medicine imports, we have to really think about the uh, prices outside because suddenly if you think, and if you have taken a decision to stop importing medication or the medicines, which is essential, rather uh, not supporting to uh, produce that thing, it will create another crisis. So these things we need uh, customized decisions with related to the consumer uh, uh, aspect. And that is all my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, for uh, listening to me and uh, I don't know whether we I am able to continue with this uh, with my, my power situation thank you very much for inviting me this day over to you Dr. Kirti thank you very much 
Dr. Tilina, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I think uh, you have like very br uh, briefly gone through it. I hope that you can come again uh, back to the Q&A session uh, if possible. So uh, now uh, we have, I mean, come towards the, the last speaker of this session. And uh, he's none other than uh, Mr. Ruan Gal again. I, even though he don't need any introduction to this seminar, but I have to uh, give a very brief, brief introduction uh, about him. Actually, he's the live wire of uh, economic related things that OPA, one of our past president, and he's having uh, hands-on experience in uh, uh, banking sector, I think, uh, top to bottom, up to CEO positions in many uh, banking related organizations. And he's a person who involved with this uh, economic crisis and uh, related issues from the OPA sides. And uh, up to now we have given uh, so many uh, proposals which have actually reached to the, the top uh, authorities and some have been implemented. Uh, to a certain extent. And so uh, with uh, so with that, I would like to focus the attention of uh, Mr. Ruan, uh, I mean, to summarize with respect to the economic situations and the, especially the, the dollar uh, crisis and the rupee crisis and how and uh, the ways and means of overcoming the current situation uh, to uh, overcome the current situation to the benefit or to turn this uh, uh, crisis situation to a much uh, healthy position uh, before start moving forward. Introduce uh, and over uh, podium to Mr. Ruan Galage. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Elena sort of took part of my, my script away. She was uh, speaking like a true uh, economist. And uh, this is the uh, this is the style that we need in this country. Hold on, please. I think I my 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 computer is on. I can go on there. Excuse me. This is good times in some way because they are going back to the good old days where we used to uh, study with the uh, with uh, the the lamp the lamp and uh, maybe forty years ago, forty fifty years ago, or even earlier than that. But the situation in the country is so bad, so unfortunate that we have to go through something like this. So unfortunate that our children has to go through something in a process like this. So it is for us as professionals to ensure that we come out of this. Dr. Kirti. Dr. Kirti. I think uh, Mr. Wangal again. Okay. I 
think uh, I have I'm doing a little bit of uh, what should I say uh, changing of seats and uh, I'm I'm positively looking at the future situation where we can wriggle out of this. Firstly, I would like to uh, show you some statistics on uh, what really had gone wrong, where it went wrong and how it went wrong. So to start that, we, we um, just looking at the first, uh, uh, not, not exactly a presentation, I'm looking at the first document that I have to be uh, shown on as number one with regard to the current economic situation. I, I call it the, the background to this problem. Uh, for a start. Say, I, I have mentioned here current economic background. The national budget in Sri Lanka is about 80 billion US dollars. At the moment, the current external debt, that's a foreign debt, is around sixty billion dollars. Domestic debt is around fifty. So that's altogether one hundred ten billion US dollars the country owes to various institutions. And the annual government loss, that is income and expenditure, is about four to five billion US dollars. So our, if if one may ask this question, why such an such a huge extra debt of one hundred ten billion for a country where the national budget is around eighty billion? The answer is we have been running at a loss for so many years. In simple terms, look at a company. They have the turnover is 80 million rupees, for an example, which has a debt of 110 million and running at a loss of 4 to 5 million per year. So that is Sri Lanka in simple terms. Then we look at what is the reason for this crisis. I I very strongly say this, this inflation is purely due to, uh, we, are, we are back into uh, electricity situation. So maybe you'll see uh, more of me as we go on. So we, uh, if you look at the current scenario, the inflationary situation for me is mainly due to the foreign currency crisis. The dollar has increased almost by 100% from 203 to 365. So being an imported imports based country, all our main items of consumption uh, and other commodities all have gone up. Look at what has happened to the loaf of bread. Look at what has happened to the cement. Look at, look at oil and gas. All these have increased simply because of this dollar crisis. I, I will, the economists will say it's money supply, the printing of money, all that. But as, 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 as non-economists, why don't we look at uh, what happened to the, uh, to the dollar and what happens to imports? So based on that, we have this crisis. Then over the years, we, if you look at, I have this statistic with me as well, the amount of exports we do, it's about $12 billion a month, uh, sorry, per annum, 12 billion. So th those figures are there uh, to be seen. Uh, I have looked at the, the last uh, six, seven years. So it's about, uh, it's a total of about, say, 20, it towers around 20 to 22 billion is the imports. Then, then we look at the exports. Exports, uh, I would say exports run into 12 billion dollars. 12 billion dollars against the import of about 22 billion. So the, the Gap there is ten billion dollars. Can we go back to the earlier chart? First one, right? Right. So we have uh, twelve billion exports, twenty-two billion imports. 
and the trade balance is 10 billion dollars comfortable with the dollar foreign remittances is 4 billion dollars per annum so that that made the dollar somewhat stable over the years and we have been maintaining that uh, with the greatest difficulty what we do is we we we, we take another loan and pay the the service the previous loans and we are this this circus has been going on for so long so going into a per month basis the exports come to about 1000 million us imports 1800 million and the trade balance is 800 million a month how it was bridged was foreign remittances provided us 600 million dollars per month and tourism provided us with 300 million 300 million dollars a month now what really happened first we will look at the tourism chart what happened to tourism firstly with the with the uh, chart number we go into chart number 5 Let us look at the, the tourism earnings that we have been having over the years. In we normally have we about three point five billion dollars per annum. Two thousand sixteen three to three point five. Two thousand seventeen three point nine billion. Then it goes up eighteen four point three. Two thousand nineteen. Look at the month of April. From April onwards, that's the Easter bomb blast. It has gone down. to a great extent to 3.6 billion again then 2020 the commencement of the covid pandemic in sri lanka the whole year what we got was six, then 2021 was worse for the whole year what we got was 141 billion dollars so the, that created a gap of 300 300 million dollars a month due to non non inflow of tourism income now i will let's look at the workers remittances the chart number 4 Yeah, until the chart comes in all right the workers remittances show this picture in 2018 we had 7.7 billion dollars coming into the country 2019 the year 2019 we had 6.7 billion dollars Then in 2020, 7.1 billion dollars. In 2021, that is the beginning of this crisis. When the 300 million per month dollars did not go into the country due to uh, non-movement of tourists, there was a gap in the foreign currency inflows and outflows. Due to that reason, the in the black market. or in the normal market i would i should say the exchange rate went up and then it was selling at around 240 rupees when we look at the month of uh, june july you see that in in june uh, 5 million and then uh, july 702 million drops to 453 million in 2021 and august 664 into 446 Seven, uh, September it's fifty percent. So the Indian system has taken fifty percent of the inflow of US dollars into the country through remittances. So now we have had a loss of three hundred million due to tourism, and then we have we have subsequently we have had a loss of another three hundred million due to this foreign remittances being part of it remitted through the Indian system. So overall from uh, but we used to get about 1900 million us dollars it had dropped to about 1300 us dollars now 
So then what the, what the central bank did was to keep the dollar at 203, they kept on pumping uh, dollars into the market to the tune of five pounds. That's from July when this situation arose from this point onwards, they kept on pumping dollars into the market, 5.5 billion US dollars to the tune of 5.5 billion US dollars. If you heard the Cope story, you will know what exactly happened there. A boat of 3 to 2 at the, at the monetary board has made Sri Lanka come to this situation to some extent. So if we had this 5.5 billion dollars as reserves, that is good enough for 11 months of oil. 11 months of oil without any issue. So we, this is our situation. And December, in January this year, we have had an inflow of $259 against the previous year's $675. And February, $205 million US dollars against $580 the previous year. March, $318 US dollars, a million US dollars against $612. Then April was worse, $519 million US dollars coming in 2021, dropping down to $248 in April this year. So that is how, how, how bad the situation is in Sri Lanka. Then we will look at the earnings from tourism as well, how the earnings from tourism have, has gone down. I have, I have shown, shown this previously. So can we take the five, the document five? Let's go. It's in the corner five. So that shows, yeah, I will, I will go to the next one. The, look at the look at the tourist arrivals. Let's go on from 2018. We have had 2.3 million tourist arrivals during 2018. In 2019, with the with the Easter disaster, it came down to 1.9 million tourists. Go to the next one. 2020. So in, in 2020, due to COVID, it drops down to 507,704. 22, 22, 22. See, 2021, we have a slight improvement. We, we go up to 194,000. Then January this year, we have gone up to 82,000 tourists. February, 96,000. March 106,000. If then it drops due to two reasons the unrest in the country due to non availability of oil and gas, as well as the Aragale to some extent. I don't blame the Aragale in any way. They have done a wonderful job for Sri Lanka. So we must really salute them for what they have done. Uh, so uh, there had been a general tendency for the tourism industry to move up. So that means. Without any tinkering by the government or any institution, in last December we have had 89,000, which is the which is one of the key months as far as tourism goes from the Western world. Then January 82,000, February 96,000. So, so there was a tendency for tourism income to go back. What we have been doing is about 200,000 tourism month. So, where I'm 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 going to move forward from here is how we can solve this issue. The economic crisis. Right. I have taken this in a I have taken this in a, in a different manner. Four truths in this whole thing. Economic crisis in Sri Lanka. First one is suffering due to economic crisis. What has happened? A. Inflation resulting in price increases. B. Shortages of essential requirements. C. Unrest which could result in anarchy. Yeah. 
just around the corner, I think, as far as uh, this is concerned. Then increase in rates of interest destroying SMEs. The, the interest was raised by 700 basis points. Now, from non-banking terms, we, we, we call it 700 basis points is because normally it is not increased in, in hundreds. It is increased in a very marginal manner. Uh, generally, it's 100, 200 in maximum. And this time it was pushed up by 700 basis points, which is equal, equivalent to 7%. So please understand what happens to an industry which had taken a facility at 10%. Oh, but I and going up to twenty percent as interest. Which is the industry which can make, which can pay twenty percent as interest from the meager profits everyone is trying to achieve? Then I have the suffering due to economic the suffering. Then we look at the origin of suffering. A, I would say it was basically the COVID-19 based drop in tourism. That's where we lost $300 million a month and which upset the equilibrium as far as the exchange rate was concerned. Then to, to mismanagement of foreign exchange in flows. We allowed a set of young people from Chatham Street take over the 50% of remittances which we have been getting for the last so many years through the banking channels. We lost it uh, for, due to mismanagement of the exchange, uh, exchange, uh, exchange uh, conditions. Yeah, we should have floated the dollar long before March and not allowed the Undial people to take over 50% of the income that was generated through remittances. Then the mismanagement of foreign reserves. I mentioned earlier. 5.5 billion, that is 5,500 million US dollars we had in reserves were wasted basically to maintain the dollar at the back down level of 203. And then the floodgates open and it goes up to 365. That is the, that is prime time mismanagement for me. Then we look at how to end this suffering. We have to, now as professionals, we have seen suffering. We have looked at what is the origin of suffering. And we, if you look at how to end this suffering, what we have proposed is seek urgent short-term credit to import oil and gas. From Samya, we have to explain that within six months, we can repay. Now, we are, we are a bankrupt country. What do we do? We, we pay 500 million bond, uh, bond settlement in, in February or March, and a few months later, we default on a $78 million payment. And we become a bank, we are, we, are, we are termed as a bankrupt country. So we have to negotiate with some form. I, I mean, this is, this is supposed to be one of the most difficult tasks for, a, for, a, for any government at this moment. Short term credit, we need about 500 million US dollars a month to import oil and gas. I think gas is under control to some extent with all the controversies on the pricing, but oil is a serious problem. So that is one area the government will have to work in all fronts. That is priority number one. Then we have to look at providing concessions to migrant employees. Now, migrant employees have been not benefited greatly other than the insurance that they get when if something happens in a foreign country and uh, as well as uh, the situation where the, uh, the when they come into the country they get a duty free allowance of I think 1,750 1,000 US dollars in that range then we have to provide now Undial why has Undial why are they going with Undial other than the the basic fact that there's about a 40 rupee advantage on a dollar when they remit it through the Indian system. When they come through a bank, a bank and that country charges a component as commission. One problem. Number two situation is our banks in Sri Lanka is not ready to deliver the, the funds exchange to the kid and kin of the people who are working abroad. 
they go up the undial people go up to the extent of uh, bringing i mean they will call the person who the recipient and raise and they will make use of that money to uh, to uh, basically even bring groceries carry the bags and help the the kids and kind of the migrant employee so unless otherwise we give them some concessions and incentives we will never be able to break them away from this situation now yesterday there was this situation the minister has the minister of foreign employment has stated in in the media that anyone anyone who has gone on a foreign assignment if he wants to repeat it if he has not sent the money through the, the banking system uh we shall will not, the, they will not approve it then i i checked on this because this is a very serious situation i think some of our own members are taking this up very strongly to find out that it's been it's in a situation government to government but still i think then when say for an example japan and korea is concerned it's through a government uh, mechanism that people are sent to these countries so if they don't send the money through the system there will be no that is what the minister has said but i think it's i mean as far as fundamental rights go and all that there could be a major issue there as i mentioned earlier create the environment to tourism development then i am looking at the path to end the suffering implement short medium and long term economic solutions prior priorities the need to develop foreign exchange inflows develop export industries we 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 are no one is talking about export industry everyone is talking about how to take the next loan how to go to imf is imf the panacea to all these issues remember we have gone to imf 16 times since 1948 we have joined imf in 1950 in 1965 we have taken the first loan and the last loan was taken in 2016 so has it changed the environment in any way as a ramp concern no then as is told economic funds to ensure input substitution we have to look at input substitution we have to you have to manufacture things we have to grow certain uh, commodities then increase the inflow and decrease the outflow of foreign currency to stabilize the exchange rate that is increase inflow that is foreign uh, foreign remittances tourism and exports then if we do that say if we can bring this which is in our uh, in our firing range we have this 300 million dollars we have lost to undial system and we have another 300 million if we sort out this unrest which will come from tourism if 600 million dollars come into the country we go back to the previous situation previous status quo the exchange rate will come down then all prices related prices on with including oil and gas will come down but that will be a lot of people will argue with me none of the prices which have gone up as ever come down then i have proposed an eight fold path towards recovery as well seek a short term credit line for 6 months 400 500 million a month provide enticing incentives to migrant employees to ensure lost 300 million dollars urgent campaign to increase tourist arrivals then seek enhanced employment quotas from all relevant countries we can give us employment opportunities revisit all free trade agreements all foreign missions to focus on development of exports and foreign employment opportunities and provide assistance unfortunately sometime back i don't know whether we still have it no we had a minister for but but we did not have a minister for apparels this is sri lanka for you and let's we have forwarded this process to various government institutions prime minister downwards we have forwarded to the governor governor was to give us gave us an appointment last month 15th or 16th and then we were informed that imf will be there he will not meet us today is 8th of july so we are we are we are we were to meet him on 15th of june i think so this is the way, way that uh, they, this country is moving forward
So as professionals, I think we have an onerous duty to stand up for what is right, to fight for what is the best for this country, and be united in our presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ruan. Uh, it's a very informative one. And I don't know, I have Sunday school. I don't know how you get into this crisis, crisis situation so nicely. And okay, uh, there are some questions waiting there in our chat. Question to Mr. Ruan. One, uh, can you comment on the, the, apart from the dollar crisis, can you comment on the rupee crisis as well? Whether there is a real rupee crisis there in the country or whether that's an extension of the dollar crisis? Definitely there's a rupee crisis as well. As the governor mentioned yesterday, uh, there's no dollars for oil and there's no rupees to buy the dollars as well for petrol incorporation. So when, uh, when, uh, when, uh, when the country is running at a loss, when the, uh, the, the national expenditure is more than the income, definitely there's going to be a crisis and we have printed so much to keep the home fires burning, but at least to ensure that the salaries are paid to the government employees. So we, 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 we do have a... Uh, uh, rupee crisis uh, on top of the dollar crisis. It is uh, generally it's a vicious cycle. It 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 should happen. Uh, uh, with that, we'll move to the first few questions there in the chat box. Uh, I think it's from our OPA president. What is the uh, the criteria to be eligible to get the five-year residence visa as a foreign investor? And what uh, and same question uh, extension for that. Uh, what kind of concessions are provided to those uh, involved in the uh, in, uh, in in direct exports? Uh, for example, person providing input to the to an ex uh, exporter. Uh, Mr. Vijayvardhan, I think uh, if you can comment Mr. on Mr. Ranjit, Mr. Ranjit Dharmasri, I think. Yes. <coughs> well, yes. I... Yeah, Dr. Keithi. Mr. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So, so Mr. Anjit, if, you can comment on this. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, this is the thing. So, one moment. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. So, this is the thing. So, we have introduced as uh, instruction given by the honorable minister to issue uh, visas for five years. So that uh, investors are the main uh, asset to our country. They bring several foreign exchanges. And uh, earlier it was uh, reviewed, it was renewed year by year. It's a very harassment to the investors. So we have to keep them convenient and we have to get their support and there are several investors uh, existing investors and we want to uh, we want their reinvestment so reinvestment is the most important thing in these days it's uh, difficult to the potential investors so by for, to promote this reinvestment this uh, is issue for five years is very important in addition to that uh, we are giving them uh, duty -free concession for the pro project related items also, the normal tax rate is 24%, but under concession rate, tax rate, 14% we can offer them. And in addition to that, so uh, very non-physical incentives are also there. So when they are investing for new investment, uh, under IR law, they can obtain the enhanced capital allowance. In near future, we will discuss with the treasury to give this enhanced capital allowance for the new expansions also. 
So anyway, we have to create in this country that exporters friendly environment. As Mr. Galagi said, we have to promote exporters, not depend on that uh, any loans or something like that. Thank you. Mr. Ranjit, uh, can you comment on the, the, the amount of minimum required amount for yeah, that sort yeah, of session? Yeah, uh, for the uh, manufacturing sector, minimum uh, threshold is uh, US dollar half a million. And uh, that agriculture sector and IT sector, uh, 150,000 US dollar and 100,000 US dollars. In addition to that, if they are willing to start that agro processing or something like that, that half a million is the uh, minimum investment threshold. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's another question. I think that uh, back again, the Mr. Ruan can take over that question. Is there any mechanism to control the dollar pricing on the Sri Lankan black market? Is there any? Yeah, there, 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 there are certain mechanisms, mechanisms that had been enforced. They have said the, the minimum amount of dollars that you can keep in hand is, uh, is $10,000. And you can keep it for a specific period of time only. Otherwise, you can't pull dollars. Then more on top of the most important thing is there was what is called this uh, open accounts. Open accounts is a system where you have a supplier in a foreign country you enter into an agreement with that supplier to pay, make the payment later on, 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 on a future date. But what really was happening was the through the Undial system, money was sent for this settlement. And the amount kept on sort of the, the, the Undial funds were used for this purpose. Now, recently, I think in June, the, the central bank enforced the uh, the uh, simply uh, enforce the rule that there will be no open account uh, imports to the country and been released on this particular limitation. So those are the controls that have been uh, enforced uh, uh, to counter this situation. Yeah. Thank you, Juan. Uh, next, I would like to turn... Uh... The mic to uh, Mr. Vijayvardhana. Uh, Mr. Vijayvardhana, uh, can you please uh, elaborate on the, the proposals or any kind of uh, directive that you have given to government uh, to, I mean, uh, to uh, answer the current problem there in the industrial sector or like, have you given any proposals right now? Uh... We actually not at institute, Especially the ones that, the policy decisions that you have mentioned. Yeah, policy paper decisions has been given by different parties, certainly not uh, the Architects Institute. Uh, and uh, I have actually written to papers many times about this, my, uh, the, the, uh, actually the, what should be done. But only thing, uh, this, this actually the this government is not in a habit of listening because i think the institute asked so many times for an interview as far as i can remember but to to meet and discuss because uh, that that was not granted you know because as i told you uh, before i told you the the uh, when 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 they want to start the economy uh, the construction industry to give a shock treatment, see the options they are selected. The options are very negative. So they should have first asked the, the team, the, the, the architects, engineers, contractors, and so on, how to, what, what do you need? Because even at that time, that huge sums of money, the government had to pay to the contractors. So despite that, they start some more construction. So that actually aggravated. Now, what are we going to do with these uh, four multi-story car parks? So, what are they? What are we going to do? We don't have cars. We don't have fuel. 
So that, that because this, this, you know, the dialogue between the government and the professionals, now some, one will say, why, why you, are, you, have, you have not spoken to the government? But that, that government should be without any barriers, you know. We must, time to time, the government should consult these people and say, so say, uh, say what, what, what should be the way forward. Without that, uh, I mean, one party decisions has led to all these issues. I want to clarify a bit. Uh, the doctor said that about my comment on the toilets, facilities. Uh, and she said they are in the queues. But only thing, that is the issue of number of toilets. But I, what, I, I, what I told them, we have so many separations in the, in, in the hierarchy. Now, if you forget about the hospitals, if you go to university, you have, see, see, you have professors, you have senior lecturers, you have lecturers, right? You have non-academic staff, then you have minor staff, then students. You know, when, when, we, dis, when we show these things to, to our foreign architects, they laugh at us. I mean, why so much of separations? You know, we have to have, because what I'm saying is, these are expensive items that we are trying to, because of our thing, we are trying to, uh, we are trying, we are spending a lot of money. Whereas, if you see, if you go to rural areas, I involved in the tsunami time, so many rural schools, you know, you don't have a single toilet for this, not for students, not for teachers. So, but what sort of imbalance we have? That that's what I want to point out. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Vijayavadana. I think uh, uh, I think the OPA tried to uh, help or like try to uh, facilitate these type of dialogues between uh, institutions and the government. So we are happy to like uh, to take uh, your proposals also through OPA channel if possible, and you can provide us with a, a written document. We will definitely invite you as well to be a part of our uh, team member. And uh, I think uh, with the other supportive uh, groups related to architecture and your industry, we will be happy to take it uh, to a, a much uh, profitable manner to every one of us. I think it's the duty of all of us at the moment. Uh, so with that, I will back again come to uh, Juan Galage uh, regarding especially the, uh, the, the, the tourism industry. Uh, especially the tourism industry, even though you uh, gave some figures, uh, the tourism industry uprise is largely due to tourists from one single country. I think uh, it's from Russia. Uh, so can you comment on that? Uh, not, not exactly. There are, there are two myths in this country. Now we think uh, normally, originally we thought the, only the Westerners, uh, mainly the Westerners come to, come to Sri Lanka. Okay, not so. We have tourists coming in from China, India, uh, and the Western world. Uh, I'll add something more with your permission, uh, uh, Dr. Deepthi. Uh, that is foreign employment. Foreign employment, a lot of people think if the funds come in from, or rather the, the, the bulk of the fund comes from the Middle East uh, sector. It is not so anymore. Although the numbers are more there, the, it's only about 50% of the total remittances. So in the same manner, even the tourism uh, spectrum, uh, the, the numbers are divided between uh, many countries. But I think there are rich tourists coming in from, uh, from uh, the Russia, uh, Russian sector, uh, and uh, maybe the, the, the spending is more. That I will like. And then to add something more about one, what, what Mr. Vijayvadan said, we have to wonder as far as the government is concerned, whether it's Biryal in Tavinaganagar Nath, Natahat, Nero fiddling while Rome is burning. We have to find out what is more appropriate. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I would like to uh, open the floor for the our uh, internet participants also to throw some questions. Uh, Dr. Keith, there is a question from the, again, uh, from our president in that last one. Indirect exports in the chat box. 
Yeah, indirect exports are having issues in relation to their imports, which are used as a inputs as they are in, as they are in uh, restrictions on import. What kind of concessions are provided to those pro provided to those uh, who are involved in the direct exports, i.e., the person providing input and exports? I think one. Can you? Yeah, I think. Uh... Mr. Dhamasiri also may be able to shed some light on this, but as far as I know, in the banking circles, even indirect exporters, they have the they they have they can be paid in dollars by the direct exporter. That dollar transfer is transfer is allowed. I say you say you supply to a major exporter as an indirect exporter. So as long as it could be proved that. This input goes into an export, the dollar transfer is there. So from as long and when you get that dollar transfer, you, you have the ability to uh, make the, the provision for import uh, purposes, stating that it's for this particular provision. I, 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 I would love to uh, uh, hear from uh, Mr. Dharmasiri also on this subject. Thank you. Yes. So. Exporters uh, uh, as expo indirect exports and direct exports are uh, considered as same. So they are earning US dollars and they are they can utilize that dollars and uh, they are the people who brings uh, dollars into the country. So anyway that uh, goods sent out of the country and then something. Yeah, I totally agree with Mr. Ruan Galagi. Thank you very much. I think uh, any more, any other participant would like to comment or pass a question to one of these eminent speakers? So, in the absence of any other questions, uh, I think today's uh, uh, today's seminar. First, I would like to, uh, as a concluding remark, I would like to indicate that I think every one of uh, every uh, speaker highlighted the the, lack, uh, the the main reason in a very short way. None, I mean the non-involvement of the professionals uh, in the process of decision-making has created a sort of a, uh, a, a sort of a miserable situation. And as a result, we are at this very uh, critical moment of our country or critical point of our economic situation. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to request uh, all the participants, all the uh, all the panelists, and the presenters uh, to forward their proposals to the OPA uh, to take it to the next level uh, with the permission of the two uh, committee chairmen, and we will uh, happy to facilitate it uh, uh, at different forums, and we will uh, submit it to the the relevant authorities also. And uh, Mr. Saman. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, Dr. Kirti, uh, uh, to before I end up, uh, please hand over to the doctor, uh, Dr. Dawa, Jini Opali uh, Javadan to do the vote of thank. So, uh, so with that, uh, with that short note, I will hand over it to uh, Mr. Opali. General Secretary, Jini uh, Opali. Jini Opali. Yeah, then General Secretary Hopi, could you please uh, can you hear me? Word of thanks. Yeah, over yeah. to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Engineer uh, Saman and the Dr. Kirti Attanayaka for giving me the opportunity to uh, propose the word of thanks after the uh, important seminar on current economic crisis uh, in the, and uh, uh, industrial changes. First of all, I must thank uh, Mr. Ranjit Dharmasiri. Uh, I think uh, he very well explained about the importance of the exports and the reinvestment uh, of the exports and uh, about the apparel industry. 
so that he said that uh, 43 percent of the total uh, export uh, uh, given by the apparel industry very much uh, important ideas about that crisis situation so then uh, 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 the, he is the director of the BOI and uh, with your important time you uh, spent with us today and I thank on behalf of the OPA for your participation and present this, uh, your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Ranjit. Then uh, Mr. D.H. Vijayawadana, uh, past president of the uh, architecture uh, and you can explain about what are the issues involved in the uh, con uh, construction industry and what are the recommendations and you clearly give us the uh, strategies to overcome this situation. And thank you, sir. You give us very important uh, message that uh, important of the dialogue with the government, uh, uh, important with the dialogue with governments and the professionals. Without that, we can't give any solution how to. And, uh, what are the crisis uh, situation? How to solve this? Uh, solve this uh, matters. It's the important is the dialogue with the professional and the government. Thank you for your participation and your presentation uh, in this uh, seminar. Uh, then, Dr. Tilina, uh, Dr. Tilina, she clearly explained impact from uh, uh, health sector in this crisis situation. Situation. I think she also crisis crisis situation uh, in this moment, and she clearly about the important factors to overcome for the uh, health uh, sectors. And finally, our own uh, presenter, uh, past president, Mr. Ruan Galagi. Uh, he is the very prominent person for the about economic uh, factors and he clearly explained about uh, uh, mainly he said that the suffering due to the crisis and end of the crisis it was the short term medium term and uh, long term uh, proposals how to end the this suffering crisis and uh, Mr. Kalge, uh spoke about the role of the IMF and uh, how to uh, tackle with uh, this uh, situation. Thank you very much, sir, for your participation and provide us the uh, information to this valuable seminar. And and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kirti. As a very competent moderator, I think I I saw that number of events you were with us to moderating the our seminars in the OPA, and I think you clearly coordinate among all the speakers and the audience, and you you try to get the outcome of the seminar, and finally, as you said, we need the outcome of the seminar to publish, uh, publish in the papers as well as the uh, our website and submit it to the government. That is our main uh, importance of this seminar. Thank you very much, sir, Dr. Kirti, for your accepting the accepting our invitation and uh, do the moderating in this seminar. Our president, Overseas, and he gave, and he gave his leadership to organize this seminar in a full manner. And she, he tried to get the he, he he also wanted to get come of this seminar to submit to the uh, results to submit to the uh, government. Thank you, Mr. Durita, for your participation and give the leadership, sir. Thank you, and NIC chairman, Dr. Raita Mikola, and, and she is very important in the OP by coordinating the and by giving the uh, national issues and collecting the national issues and uh, and she provide all the issues to the relevant committees and 
she also uh, give her fuller support and cooperation uh, to organize this type of seminars and try to get out uh, outcome of these seminars and submit to the uh, uh, relevant parties. Thank you, Madam, for your uh, participation to organize this seminar. And uh, other shaman, also the Mr. Ruan Galagi, uh, and thank you again, thank you for your support from your uh, committee. And finally, uh, Engineer Saman uh, is the chairman of the seminars, workshop and program, program committee. And uh, I, I know that he wanted to at least one seminar in a month. And I think today he is, uh, he tried to uh, held this, I think a couple of weeks back also, due to this crisis situation, he couldn't do that. But finally, he make it a success today at the crisis situation, how to how to uh, overcome the uh, economic crisis and the industrial challenges. So that I must thank engineer uh, Saman uh, for your uh, for your organizing and coordination with other committees as well as the uh, as well as experience uh, to get the uh, speakers and the uh, 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 speakers and the other supporters thank you very much engineer saman Kana. thank you very much and uh, engineer dr rakogama i think uh, you are the convener of this committee and you played big role to organize this and thank you very much for you. Uh, and uh, uh, i must thank all the participants I think uh, this is an online seminar. Uh, I saw that uh, uh, many people uh, connected to the through their Zoom uh, and using their own valuable data and the valuable time. I thank on behalf of the Organization of Association, all the participants. Without your participation, this will not affect your success. So that you are validated. Finally, not last, but at least, but not last, I must thank center director and the staff for their support to, uh, I mean, uh, providing the facility and preparing the flyer and all the supports. I thank center director and staff for uh, uh, your courage, uh, current support and, uh, uh, support and help us to do this seminar well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Oh, thank you very much. Good night.